All right. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks, Laurel. I always look to you to see you giving me the thumbs up. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Boddy. I'm the membership and events manager here at the Asheville Art Museum. I want to thank you all for being here for today's member program. It's been a couple of weeks since our last program, and I hope you're all as excited as I am to hear from our associate curator, Whitney Richardson, and our assistant curator, Hilary Schroeder, as they discuss some new artworks that are on view at the museum. Uh, but before I turn this over to them, I just want to go over some housekeeping for all our attendees. So first, please note that all microphones are muted by default. We are recording today's program, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video also remains off. Um, both the microphone and video camera symbols will have red lines through them at the bottom left of your screen. And we will be sharing this recording tomorrow on our YouTube channel. Uh, and if you would like to ask any questions or make any comments during the program, you're more than welcome to just put those in the chat box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. And Whitney and Hillary will get to those when they can. And after this program's over, I will send out an evaluation for you all to fill out. The information that you provide us with through these evaluations is really important as we work to improve our Zoom programs, but it also provides us with information we need when applying for grants or reporting on programs, uh, which is extremely important during this time. So please do keep that in mind when you fill that out. Uh, and finally, as you all know, this has been a challenging year for the museum and for the world. If you can, please support us this fall. Our gala is coming up very soon. And whether you bid on some of our live or silent auction items, purchase a Buy It Now piece, or just make a donation, your contributions make it possible for us to keep exhibiting some wonderful works, offer vital educational programs, and maintain our collection, the building, and of course, our wonderful staff. Um, and if a monitor donation appeals to you. You can also visit our support page to learn more about our COVID relief fund and matching challenge. Through the end of the year, all annual fund donations and membership upgrades will be matched dollar for dollar by a longtime foundation supporter. So any gift you give will have double the impact. So thank you to everyone who has contributed already, and I hope we can continue to count on your support. And now I'll turn this over to Whitney. Thanks so much. Whitney, I think you're muted. We can't hear you. All right. How about now? Better. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Whitney Richardson. I'm one of the curators here at the Asheville Art Museum, and I'm really excited today. I'm going to talk you through a new exhibition that just opened today uh, called Fantastical Forms, Ceramics as Sculpture in our Judith S. Moore Gallery. Um, it will be open um, until April 5th. 2021. Um, and the Judith S. Moore Gallery is on our third floor. So I definitely encourage you all to come have a look. Hopefully you'll, getting, you'll be getting a little taste of it today and, and want to come check it out for yourself. Um, the idea behind what I'm going to do um, with Fantastical Forms, um, and then I'll turn it over and, and um, work with Hillary to show you some of our first rotations as we reopened after being closed um, due to COVID um, in our collection hall. Uh, first, I'm going to go through Fantastical Forms and talk about that exhibition, it's about 25 works of art, so not a huge exhibition, um, but hoping to give you a little bit of a look at um, realized it in my picture up for you. Um, give you a little bit of a look at what's in that exhibition, talk about the artists that are in that exhibition, how they relate to one another, and then from time to time go into the collection hall as well and show you some of the ceramics in the collection hall and how it relates to fantastical forms out on our core gallery. So we're going to start in the collection hall, um, keep you waiting a little longer. Um, both locally and nationally, um, ceramics often serve a practical purpose. Um, for a long time, people thought of ceramics as their dinnerware, as vases, as pitchers, um, uh, very functional, functional things to have around the house. Um, and then around 1870, this idea of art pottery, it was called, came about where the piece was probably still functional. Often it was a vase, um, but 
for the most part, it wasn't going to be used. It was meant to be displayed in your home as a work of art. It was a little more uh, detailed, perhaps, um, and showed off the artwork of the decorator of the piece. So this one here in the collection hall is non cona pottery. This is Walter B. Stephen um, when he was younger working with his mother, um, Nellie Stephen, and the art pottery that they were doing was um, influenced by the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. Um, his mother um, had either attended or had friends that attended and talked about um, Wedgwood pottery. And she became very in interested in that and started um, trying to copy that, that aesthetic that was so popular. So that was a look at uh, a local pottery. Here we have a nationally known pottery, Newcomb College pottery, um, still on view in our collection hall. Um, and of course here, they, I mean, it's, it's a painting, right? It's a painting on a vase. Um, their Moss and Moonlight series was so popular. Um, they started with it in the 1920s and didn't stop until the pottery went out of business um, around 1940. Um, and so again, in both cases here, we're looking at vases that are um, functional. You could fill them up with water and put a flower in it. Um, but the idea was really to display it in your home and show it off um, as a work of art. Um, then we get into the, um, at the end of World War II and the GI Bill is introduced and makes it possible for a lot of um, men coming back from the war to take classes at colleges. And, and there's this real um, surge of interest in ceramics, um, primarily functional, but there starts to be this, um, this side of things where they're, they're getting a little more experimental and they're trying to push beyond making um, beer steins and bowls for daily use. Um, and they, they start to see themselves um, as artists using ceramics as their medium. Um, and as those artists experience uh, success, they then begin to teach other students in ceramics. And that's where our collection really comes in. We have some works by the teachers, some works by the students later in the um, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and so this exhibition is looking at those relationships between um, student and teacher, how what was called art pottery came to be art. It's just a piece of sculpture um, that happens to be made out of ceramic. Um, and we're gonna start here with Don Wright's. It's kind of a big jump going from Newcomb pottery to this piece, right? Um, and, and keep in mind too, art pottery, as we saw it with Newcomb was still popular into the 1940s and 50s um, when he was really beginning his career. He, uh, Don Wright's you see on your screen here, um, served in the U.S. Navy from 48 to 53, and when he left, um, he used the GI Bill to go to college. Um, he was at Cutstown State Teachers College, where he actually studied abstract expressionist painting, um, but it was also there that he discovered pottery. Um, when he graduated in 1957, he went on to attend Alfred University's College of Ceramics in New York, and you'll hear this university probably going to say it about 10 more times throughout the presentation. Um, it's really become well known for its training of um, ceramic artists. Um, Wrights took over the position of ceramics teacher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison actually after that from Harvey Littleton who um, we're partially replacing in this exhibition. We have the glass exhibition up um, and some of Harvey Littleton's pieces but of course he also began as a ceramicist. Uh, the piece that we have here on the left of your screen is from Don Wright's Sarah series. And this was something that he began in the mid 1980s. Um, around the same time, he was in a very bad car accident. Um, his niece was hospitalized um, with a diagnosis of leukemia. And during the time they were both hospitalized um, at separate hospitals, um, would write letters and, and she would send him drawings. And so when they both were healed and well and out of the hospital, he began this series in the mid eighties where he would use a lot of her drawings to inspire his work. So um, 
started very much as a functional potter, making things that people would buy and use on a daily basis. And, and you can see by this point, he's making something. This is a um, little over 24 inches tall, right? It's technically a vessel. It's got a lid and, and um, could function as one, but it's really meant to be an artwork. Um, and, and I think it is, it's one of our favorites. Right. The next one, this is back in the collection hall. It's another piece we have up by Don Wrights right now. Um, and this work is wood fired. This is before his Sarah series, uh, or actually this one's after his Sarah series, but before Sarah, the Sarah series, he became well known for using salt glazes. Um, and this, again, he picks up on it here um, with a wood fired stoneware, very minimal look. Um, and really showing his hand, literally. If you look at the lower right corner, you can see sort of his three middle fingers coming up through the ceramic. So all about the gesture of the artist and um, his emotion as he's, as he's creating this in a different way than the emotion he probably had when he was creating his Sarah series works. Um, the next group of artists we're gonna look at in the exhibition are Robert Chapman Turner, Karen Carnes and Toshiko Takezu. Um, they all led the way in exploring the definition of what a vessel meant. Um, while each artist started their career making functional pottery, it's a common story. Um, you're, you know, you can make money that way, you can um, support yourself. Um, they all sought to experiment with this form and redefine what a vessel meant. Um, does it have to be functional? Um, or not. Um, the works that we'll see here are all from later in their careers. Um, and while Turner and Takeizu's works are, are still playing with the vessel form, Karn's is a little bit more sculptural and you'll see that here. Um, so here we've got Robert Turner. Um, Turner graduated from Swarthmore College in 1936. Um, he studied painting again at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art um, and then went on to earn his master's degree at Alfred University College of Ceramics in New York, um, let's see, in 1949. From there, he took a position in our area at Black Mountain College as the first ceramics instructor at the college. And he was there from 1949 until 1951 uh, when he returned back to Alfred University in New York to take a faculty position um, teaching ceramics there. Uh, this piece here that you see, Akan, he became later in his career really interested with not only the idea of the vessel, but what the vessel meant in different cultures. And here he was um, experimenting and really looking at African vessels. And you'll see when you come into the museum to look at the piece, there's actually a hole towards the bottom. So it's definitely not a functional vessel. Um, but this one is playing on some some forms that he saw in Africa and, and was looking at how those could be seen as sculpture. All right, let's see. Next up, we have Karen Carnes. Um, again, back in our area, she was at Black Mountain College um, as a student first in the summer of 1947 um, and then returned in 1952 to take over Robert Turner's position. So the, the gentleman we just looked at was ceramic first ceramics instructor um, and then came Karen. Um, she and her husband at the time, David Weinrib, were the two ceramics instructors at Black Mountain College. Um, and while teaching there, um, Carnes was responsible for bringing Shoji Hamada, Bernard Leach, and Marguerite Wildenhain to the college, all well-known ceramicists. Um, they were touring the United States in 1952 and came to Black Mountain College to do a demonstration for the students, which um, was very influential to a lot of students of this area um, at, at Black Mountain College. And you can see a lot of that in the exhibition we have right now on the second floor, um, looking at the traditions in North Carolina clay. Uh, Karen was also a member of the Southern Highland Craft Guild while she was here in North Carolina. Um, she took a workshop while she was here at Penland School of Craft in 1967, and this is really where she began experimenting with salt firing. 
Um, she also received a graduate fellowship at Alfred University. Again, right, we should do a count on the screen each time I say that they went there um, at the College of Ceramics in New York. Um, and this work of, that we're seeing on the screen here is from later in her career um, where she was really experimenting with sculptural forms. At the very top, it might be hard to see, um, there's a hole. So this is technically a vessel. It's solid on the bottom um, with an opening at the top, um, but certainly has much more of a feel of a sculptural piece. All right, the third person in this, they're in a case together in the exhibition. This is Toshiko Takezu. Uh, she was born in Hawaii and she actually studied ceramics under Claude Horain at the University of Hawaii um, from 1948 to 1951. Uh, she then continued her studies at Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. And that's where she met Maya Grotel, um, who really became her ceramics mentor. And um, she was of Japanese heritage, um, but had never been to Japan and first went in 1955. And there met Shoji Hamada that I just mentioned that came to Black Mountain College in 52. Um, so again, reaching out to this same kind of network of people and being influenced by them. And when she was there and, and met him, she became very interested and, and influenced by Japanese um, traditional pottery techniques. Um, she taught for many years at many institutions. This is something that we'll see as we go through the exhibition, uh, you know, by doing so that this person is becoming an influence on many future artists in ceramics. Um, and the, the application of the glaze here, I wanted to point out as well. Um, in many of her works of this time period, later in her career, the glaze is just freely poured onto the piece, um, which is really reminiscent of abstract expressionist paintings. Think of Jackson Pollock splashing paint onto the canvas. She's really doing the same thing, splashing the glaze onto her canvas, which was ceramics. Um, and, and as well here, this is technically a vessel, right? There's an opening at the top. It's um, completely sealed at the bottom, um, but it is really not functional. Um, it's meant to be a work of art. Um, speaking of the, the abstract expressionist influence on pottery, um, in our collection hall right now um, in the Broughton Gallery, um, we have works by uh, Peter Volkus and Jim Leedy on view, as well as that, that earlier one we saw of Don Wright's um, three, three artists that were very much influenced by abstract expressionism. Um, in their work. And this one that you see here, this is by Peter Volkis. Um, he went to Montana State University, again, to study painting, um, but it was there that he was introduced to ceramics and changed his mind. He got his MFA from the California College of Arts in Oakland. And after graduating um, with his MFA, started a ceramics business with his classmate, um, another renowned ceramicist, Rudy Audio. And together they, um, they were very successful at producing dinnerware, right? Um, I think it's, it's fun that we have these platters by them because it's a really uh, straightforward path from you need a plate to eat off of to punching holes in it and adding little bits, of, in this case, um, of porcelain in it and playing around with this very traditional, functional, necessary form of the plate and turning it into something that you put on the wall as a work of art. Um, in 51, um, Audio and Volkis um, became the first resident artist at the Archie Bray Foundation in Montana. And it was in 1953 that Volkus came to our area to Black Mountain College to teach uh, a summer session. And that was really where he, Volkus started to transform from creating functional dinnerware pieces to ab using abstract expressionism as a really big influence on his work. Um, he was there at the same time as Franz Klein, who was teaching painting and, um, and really had a big influence on him. Uh, then of course, uh, Volkus himself goes on to teach and exhibit all around the country and, and once again have influence on a lot of other ceramicists. 
This is the one in the collection um, by Jim Leedy, um, one of Volkus's contemporaries. Jim Leedy also studied painting, um, moved to New York to be with the abstract expressionist painters in the 1950s. Um, but then when he ended up going to Montana, um, I forget if it was to teach or to work. Um, it was in Montana that he met Volkus and Audio. And they said, yeah, you, you've got it right on the abstract expressionism, but forget the canvas. You've got to be using clay. Um, and that's where he really came into the picture um, in the 60s and picked up on that. All right, back in the um, Fantastical Forms exhibition. This is Akira Satake. He is a uh, local Asheville artist, um, has a store in the River Arts District. And I love this idea of his piece by calling it sculptural vase. He's really defying any categorization of his work. It's a sculpture, it's a vase. And he, he's just like, put it all together there for you to figure out. Um, and something that's really interesting about him, he spent a lot of his uh, life um, up till 2003 as a full-time musician. And in 2003, moved to the area and began working um, with ceramics and creating, um, creating pieces, functional and sculptural for his business. And I think you can see that sort of movement and rhythm in his work that would come from a musician um, that really makes for uh, beautiful sculptures. All right, this piece we have here by Michael Sherrill. Oh wait, I'm gonna stop and read a question here. I note that there are several pieces untitled. Are they signed by the artists? Yeah, in a lot of cases, let me see if I can go back then. So Jim Leedy and Volkus both have untitled works. And that was sort of them leaning into this idea that they're, they're a painter on ceramics, right? They don't have to title their work um, and just taking a freedom in that. They are signed by the artist. Um, you know, you can see Leedy actually signed right across the front. It's sort of the lower left quadrant of the piece. But yeah, sometimes they would just give them the untitled or they didn't give them a title at all. Um, the Michael Sherrill work here, I've got two pictures of it because it's two-sided and you'll be able to see that when you come in and visit it in person. Um, of course, Michael Sherrill is a self-taught potter. Um, he began in the 1970s making functional pieces, um, water pitchers, beer steins. Um, and just as he kind of grew himself as a potter, um, really explored the glazing and firing techniques from, from all over the world, um, especially Asia. Um, he adopted these techniques into his own vocabulary and really expanded his, his own style as he learned all these. Um, and this idea here, it's called a blue spiral bottle. Um, and it's this idea of a bottle form that's just been so stretched and wrapped around that it's, of course, not functional anymore. Um, and then he, is since, since um, establishing himself in the area, has gone on to teach and exhibit around the country as well, influencing future generations of artists. This piece um, by Bill Griffith is called Dwelling. Um, Griffith has taught at Aeromont School of Arts and Crafts since the late 1980s. Um, he has held lectures and workshops around the world um, and continues to make simultaneously utilitarian works and sculptural works. And his sculptural work really revolves around the idea of shelter. Um, he's often very interested, um, the same way that we saw Turner was interested in vessels from uh, different cultures. Um, Bill Griffith is really interested in the idea of, of ancient shelters and different cultures. And this one here in particular was really influenced by um, Anasazi, Anasazi Pueblos, um, as well as Mayan huts um, that have that similar small door. Um, and this one's really fun to see in person too, because as you go around, there's sort of little windows cut into it that you can peek through and get light through. This next one here, Jane Palmer. It's funny, I was talking to our director this morning and she, she was thinking this may have never been on view before. So if that's true, uh, if her memory's right, then this is really great. I'm glad we have this piece out. 
um, and it's really striking when you see it in the exhibition. Uh, Jane Palmer, um, her connection to us is really South Carolina. Um, she studied ceramics at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, um, and then she taught pottery classes and exhibited around the country for a couple decades before settling um, at Morris College in South Carolina in Sumter. Um, around 1990. Um, and 1993, she apprenticed at the California Institute of Earth Art and Architecture. Um, her whole life as an artist um, was shared with her life as an environmentalist. Um, and so it made a lot of sense for her to go and study um, homes being built from clay. Um, and the conical shape um, that you see here in this piece is really evocative of Cal Earth's, what they call their super adobe. And it was this technology they were working on in the early 90s um, where they were hoping to be able to teach people how to, uh, without, without a lot of money or, um, yeah, people, people who didn't have homes and perhaps weren't afraid, weren't, uh, it wasn't possible to afford how to build out of clay their own their own dwelling, their own structure. Um, and this ceramic piece is probably from her time in South Carolina. Um, she went back and forth South Carolina and California during this time and died really young. Um, it was a, a tragic car accident, actually. She passed away. And so this is really one of the later works um, from, from her life. Another piece that's out on view um, in fantastical forms is this Norm Shulman piece, um, the Harlequin and Jester, and this is from his Stile series. So Stiles are, are ancient um, monolithic monumental slabs of stone, and of course his are, are not stone, his are ceramic um, walls that he's creating. It's not a solid slab of ceramic, it's built. Um, and uh, what else do I want to say about Norm Shulman? Um, he's, of course, um, was in our area. He moved to Penland in 1978 um, and opened his studio. Um, his training and education started in New York. He was at Parsons School of Design. He was at NYU. Um, and then he earned his MFA as well from Alfred University. Um, he then taught at the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, I think he had some overlap there as well with um, Harvey Littleton um, that we mentioned earlier. He taught at the Rhode Island School of Design and um, of course then taught back at Alfred again. Um, and something that's really interesting about this work, um, a lot of Shulman's works look at duality and he's playing with that not only in having a, a double walled figure in the construction. There's actually a character on each side of this piece. One is the Harlequin, one is the Jester. So again, a duality of characters. Um, and often when he would portray a character on his work um, in the shape of a star, which you can see this is sort of an abstracted star form, um, it usually meant he was referencing himself. So this um, dual nature in himself of being the the Harlequin and the Jester. All right, this work we have um, Column, it's called Column um, by Xavier Tubes. Um, he was academically and factory trained in the art of ceramics, um, but he's one of the few ceramicists in this exhibition to really have begun his career making sculpture rather than making functional pieces. Um, Although a lot of the times he's using the same techniques. He's using a wheel, he's making things from a coil or from a slab of clay. Um, so using those same techniques, but creating sculpture rather than functional work. Um, he taught um, here in North Carolina at UNC Chapel Hill, um, and then also at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. All right, this one here, um, gray baby elma mcbride johnson actually um would display entire walls of these and call them her gray babies plural um and this is just one one of those um 
she was uh, she helped develop the ceramics program at UNC Asheville um, in the mid 70s and headed the department then for 20 years. Um, and the idea behind these gray babies was um, her own reflection on children who suffer abuse. So very personal um, reflection while making while making a work of art for the public. Um, so, and education was really big for her, of course, as the head of the department at UNCA. Um, education was also really big for Neil Noland. He began um, his studies um, here in Asheville at Black Mountain College from 1949 to 1950. Um, and his sculptures explore this interest in um, painting and sculpture together which I think we've seen before. Uh, Jim Leedy, Don Wrights, Peter Volkus all sort of began as painters and ended up doing ceramic sculpture, so he's not alone there. Um, and his brother, Kenneth Noland, um, went on to become a very famous color field painter. And so I think you can really see that influence here in this piece. So of course, Neil Noland was at BMC the same time that Robert Turner was at BMC, so would have been his ceramics teacher. Um, and I just wanted to point it out. Of course, these two works are from um, different time periods. It's not when he was a student of Turner's at all, but um, I really like comparing the two and thinking about how one has influenced the other. And I, I especially noticed the sort of uh, rough form on the left of Nolan's and the, the rough pieces added to Turner's and, and really seeing the hand of the artist. Uh, the next one here, we've got Cynthia Bringle. Um, this is a new piece for us. We just acquired it earlier in the year, so this is the first time it's been displayed. A uh, really wonderful wall piece. Um, Cynthia, as well, started her education at the Memphis Academy of Art to study painting um, and was quickly drawn into the study of ceramics while she was there. So again, we have a work that exemplifies this um, this mix of these two disciplines of painting and ceramics. Um, and this one is especially really remarkable. When you see it in person, you can see the weight of it. A lot of her functional pottery that she's very well known for um, in the 70s and 80s, she would do raku firing, um, which is a process where you take the piece out of the kiln while it's still red hot and quickly put it into an environment that takes away um, all the oxygen and it starts to react with different uh, materials um, in that new environment and can cause the color reactions and the crackling that you see. And so to do that with a small, you know, eight inch pot, not so hard to do that with a huge wall work. Um, she certainly had some assistance because that it's really remarkable. Um, Bringle received her graduate degree from Alfred University College of Ceramics as well, and it was there that she studied under Robert Turner. Uh, she then moved to Penland and set up her studio, and she's still working there today. Yeah, Laurel, good, good point. Quite a number of women in this profession. Um, and that kind of goes back to this idea of the art pottery uh, from its very inception in the United States pottery and a lot of decorative arts were seen as uh, acceptable ways for women to express themselves as an artist. Um, it wasn't painting. You weren't going to a formal academy with a bunch of the men. Um, it was kind of separated. And so there's this lineage that women were allowed to be artists in this medium. Um, and I think now, of course, we can we can go to art school and do whatever we want, but it's got that trajectory that um, women have always been allowed to and, and therefore have continued to be interested in the medium today. Another one we have in the collection hall. Uh, oh, wait, now did I? There, sorry, I missed one. Um, Cynthia Bringle um, was, of course, uh, studying at Alfred University under um, Robert Turner. Um, he was in the faculty there from 1958 to 79, and she graduated in 62. So she would have studied directly under Robert Turner here. Uh, another one in the collection hall, and again, bringing it all back to our area. This is um, Christina Cordova, Penland 
uh, artist. Um, so far, we've looked at Norm Shulman and Cynthia Bringle in Penland, um, but Cordova settled in the area in 2002, so her time there overlaps both of them. Um, Cordova also earned her MFA from Alfred University College of Ceramics, and actually she and Cynthia Bringle at different decades um, also spent some time at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts in Maine. Now this one, had uh, my, my slide of this is of course made up by me where I put the little pictures in the right order, but now it's so exciting. You can come into the museum and see this actually on the wall, um, on shelves um, installed on the third floor. So I'm, I'm really excited for you all to come and see it. Um, this is Virginia Scotchy, of course. Um, her object maker series is this idea of abstract forms that are somehow reminiscent of actual functional objects or things that you might recognize. Um, I'll point out here the two indigo colored pieces. Um, the museum commissioned this uh, with the the help and funds of our 2019 collector circle. Um, and so we really asked uh, Virginia Scotchy to think about Asheville. Um, she was born in Virginia, but, but grew up in Asheville and began her studies of ceramics here. And so it said, you know, think about that as you're working on this piece for us. And the bottom, I guess what would be at six o'clock, um, she, when she was young and growing up, she was a member of the Mickey Mouse Club and so wanted to include a, a sort of, sort of Mickey Mouse, sort of not in, in her style of you recognize it, but it's not quite an exact quote. Um, and then the other indigo piece is really interesting, a very traditional sort of form and not something she normally does. You can see the other pieces are very whimsical and and invented in her imagination. Um, but, but she wanted to do something that was very representative of, of traditional pottery um, in her work of art because of her time in Asheville. Um, she, Scotchy, earned her graduate degree also at Alfred University um, College of Ceramics um, and then um, has been at the University of South Carolina in Columbia for the last 27 years as the head of the ceramics department there. Um, and is really an important part of the lineage of, of Asheville, of Western North Carolina, abstract sculptural ceramicists. So Virginia Scotchy, um, you see on your screen here with her um, Around the World series, was a student of, of Alma McBride Johnson's at UNC Asheville. Um, when she left UNCA, she went on to apprentice with Don Davis, a potter, um, in the Asheville area, I think uh, Beaver Dam. And he himself had trained with Norm Shulman. So it's this idea that all these artists are working together and learning from one another that I really love um, how much that influences what we're seeing in this exhibition. So I hope you come and check it out. Um, it'll be on view until April 5th. And if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the box. and. I'll turn it over to Hillary to share her screen and we can look at some rotations in the collection hall. Hey everyone, give me a second while I try to juggle all of my computer screen things. Um, let's see. See if we can get this going. All right, how are we looking? Right. Um, so we wanted to share with you, our wonderful members today, some of the new works that are up in the exhibition, um, Intersections in American Art up in our collection hall. You'll see that it says here August 2020, which is when we started working on getting all these rotations up for um, whenever we might reopen, which we were finally able to do in September. So these changes were made while we were closed, one of the many things keeping us busy during that time. Um, so I'm going to share most of what's happened uh, recently, but not everything to entice you to come in and see some things in person yourself. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about why museums rotate artworks. Um, 
So there are quite a variety of reasons that in something like a collection hall like we have, you might change works out with some regularity. Probably the top reason is conservation and preservation. So particularly works on paper, they are inherently a little bit unstable as a medium. Um, because think about what happens to like newspaper if you let it sit out in the sun too long or something like that. We're certainly not doing that in a museum setting, but just as a best practice in the museum field, we often will take works off view and let them rest, so to speak. So if they've been up for three to six months, they will often come down and go off view for a little while. So that was a big factor in some of these rotations. They'd been up for a while since we opened and it was time to take them down and let them rest. Um, it's a sad thing sometimes because a favorite work might go off view, but a great thing because it allows us to bring out new things that are exciting and fun. Uh, other reasons that a museum will rotate out an artwork is to replace works that are going out on loan. Uh, sometimes we will put something up to tell a new story or tell the same story in a different way, which I think you will see is a big factor in how we have sort of thought about what works we've brought on view in our collection hall and we'll continue to bring on view in that exhibition. Um, sometimes we like to share new exhibitions that we're really excited or new acquisitions that we're really excited about that have been brought into the collection recently and you will see some of that today. Uh, Whitney pointed out that the, uh, oh shoot, that curving form, who's, I'm gonna forget the name of the artist, Whitney. Um, Which one, in fantastical forms? Yes, the one that hasn't been on view. Oh yeah, Jane Palmer. Yep. So, for example, that work has been in storage, and sometimes we like to bring those things that might not have been out in a long time um, onto view. At times, we will also respond to important conservation or conversations or events that are happening in our world. It can be nice to be topical sometimes with what's on view. And especially important, offering variety to our visitors. And as members, we want you all to come back, and we want you to experience new fun things, not just in our changing exhibition halls, but in the exhibition hall that contains our collection. So sharing stuff that is new and fresh and exciting is fun for us and hopefully fun for y'all too. So specifically today, we are talking about rotations in the exhibition Intersections in American Art. Uh, I hope that all of you have had a chance to either see it in person or to check it out on the awesome online 360 viewer that we've got. Uh, just to give a little bit of a reminder, if you have not had a chance to dig deep into that exhibition yourself, there are a couple of themes that we organize that exhibition around that I think are pretty influential in how we choose what is going to go up on view both initially and in these rotations. So a big part of our collecting strategy and our um, exhibition strategy for the collection is the artistic and ideological exchange in the United States and Western North Carolina slash Southern Appalachia. So ideas coming in and out of our region, um, broader ideas that are important in art in the United States um, in the 20th and 21st centuries. And then within the sort of rest of the space or throughout the space, we encourage visitors to think about a couple of themes that can be applicable to single works of art or all works of art. So time and place, where and when a work was made and what context the artist might have made it. Um, experiments of material and form. So artists that are trying something new, maybe with materials or ideas or forms or shapes that have not been done before. And then collaboration and interdisciplinary dialogue. So artists who are looking from outside of sort of their own normal mode of working or to other disciplines like music or science to inspire their, their creative practice. So I'm going to pop it back over to Whitney real quick to talk about what is happening um, in the next slide. And I think you'll see a friend from earlier, that lovely um, Newcomb vase in that case there. Yeah. All right, so here, this is in the Lenoche Gallery, and, and actually in another reason that we think about rotations um, was one we never expected um, was COVID-19, uh, and thinking about how to space out our artwork a bit more so that the visitor um, can remain a safe distance from other visitors, um, and that's true in the cases as well, um, and in this, in this case, in this case, um, we switched out a couple pieces, um, a Oscar Lewis Batchelder, Omar Khayyam Pottery got switched for another piece by him. Um, 
a Pisgah Forest uh, vase got switched out for another one. Uh, same with Tiffany Glass and Fulper Pottery. Um, but you have to think about spacing the work out, um, uh, giving the full range of the story that you're trying to tell illustrated by the works that are in the case. Um, and and also the actual size of the case you're working with. So um, before I had a much larger batch elder in there, and if I wanted to switch out for the other Pisgah Forest pottery piece, I didn't have room. So you have to start rethinking this whole lineup of what can fit into a case together. Um, and that's a, a, a little bit part of what happened here. Um, but I really like that we were able to bring out the Tiffany and the Fulper both in this bud vase form, which was so popular in art pottery. Um, in the early part of the 20th century. So they get to be little twins sitting next to each other there now. I guess if you wanna to go to the next slide. Yeah, these are just some close-ups so that you can see. Um, this is the Batch Elder vase. Um, before there was a, a black Albany slip pitcher in the case, and now it's this iridescent um, sort of glaze uh, on the work. Much smaller piece. I can go to the next one for me. Um, here we have the, the Tiffany bud vase. Um, again, once I had to switch out the large fulper, um, I really liked the idea of having the two bud vases together. Go ahead to the next one, Hillary. Yeah, and then here we have a fulper, um, a national company. So the Batch Elder was local. Um, Pisgah Forest Pottery, of course, is local. Um, and then fulper and Tiffany were nationally known in the early part of the 20th century. Um, all, all experimenting similarly in the ceramics with glazes and um, influencing back and forth one another, like Hillary was mentioning, as we, as we really look forward to showing in our collection. Um, the crystalline glaze that um, Walter B. Stephen was known for and um, figured out on his own how to do was something that national potteries were also doing at the time. Um, and so we get to show some of that. And you can see just the hint here of the pink interior, which was his, one of his signature um, designs to his works. He was uh, always located in this area of the country and really liked to use that pink as a reflection of the sunsets. All right, are we on to the next gallery then? All right, Hillary. Um, so, while a lot of our rotations have happened for sort of resting purposes, there were other choices made that were intentional around, as Whitney mentioned, spacing and making sure everyone felt comfortable in the gallery. And so we actually switched out a larger painting by Beatrice Reese with a smaller work on paper that I actually kind of love this change out um, because the work is called Glass Pieces. Um, and it's really active and fun and a lovely purple. And um, Beatrice Reese was part of the pattern and decoration movement. So really interested in this repetition and almost like textile, like design quality. Um, I also really like that she was a member of the AIR Artist in Residence Gallery in New York, which was the first feminist run gallery in the United States. So sort of some fun sort of 1980s feminism action coming through in this work. Whitney, did you want to add something? Oh, yeah. I was going to say I love that it's called glass pieces, too, because then it's displayed with these glass pieces. And one's a John Kuhn glass piece. Oh, there's a picture. Um, one's a John Kuhn glass piece that's named after music. And there's a Gary Beecham glass piece that's named after textiles. And so this idea of interdisciplinarity is so well represented and, and sort of explained in this corner. And it's just one of those really sort of nice moments when things come together to have a work called Glass Pieces that not only looks fabulous with the other works, but has like the same color palette. I always find this to be a really soothing sort of, but still fun spot in the galleries that I like to visit when I'm in there. So just one small change in that gallery. And these are mostly going to be changes that are happening in sort of the, the later third part of the galleries. Um, we will be making some more rotations here in the near future. So uh, just again, that sort of constant change makes it worth coming in to see what's new. 
And if you'll excuse the slight blurriness of my little panorama here, I wanted to give a sense of the space that we're in. So this is the Flores Bressler Gallery. And we've had some changes in there, again, for a variety of reasons. Um, and you'll note that things are a little more spaced out in here, but just to give you a sense of sort of what the, the space looks like. And again, I'm not gonna talk about everything, although I might be talking about most of what's in here, but it's really great to come in and see and experience everything in person. And I would encourage you to do that if you feel comfortable now that we are open again. So um, the first work I want to touch on in this space is a recent acquisition um, that has not been on view yet. And you're gonna hear me say that a lot. It is a work by Saul LeWitt, who's really well known for sort of his colorful um, abstract line drawing. Some of you may recall that there was a large wall drawing uh, that was in the museum before we closed. And this is a smaller work um, that's made up of multiple works on paper. And this um, work really kind of gets at one of our themes, the idea of interdisciplinarity uh, for me, because I'm the first person to admit that I'm not a math person. There's a reason I'm an art historian, but this, work actually really beautifully illustrates sort of a logical mathematical, um, uh, I guess, problem or idea where it's sort of all possible combinations on view. And so this work actually takes all possible combinations of um, the colors represented in the work, uh, which would be red, gray, or white, gray, black, red, yellow, and blue layered or paired with each other. Um, and it's kind of fun to really get lost in some of the patterns when you're looking at this work. And he was a conceptual artist. So really thinking about the ideas behind the work, not just minimalism or ab abstraction, but the idea being really core to what he was doing. And so this is a really great example of him taking an idea from another discipline entirely and using it as the conceptual approach to creating the work. And also in that space, we have two works actually on view by Bessie Harvey, who was a self-taught artist working here in the Southeast. Um, she was someone who worked a lot with found materials, which you see in this untitled mask that is actually on the left here. Um, she was really interested in the way that the pieces of something came together almost like a puzzle. Uh, she was very inspired by her religion and her faith and, um, has had spoken many times to how sort of she felt moved by her spirituality to create um, as well as um, her family and relationships and I um, really love looking at this work you are your brother's keeper and sort of seeing this figure that seems to be looking over younger siblings and it's kind of sweet but what is really great about this work is to look at how an artist works in different media and thinking about this idea of sort of interdisciplinarity within media um, here she's working in sort of, I think there are markers and crayon and other um, drawing media and then working also with sculpture um, to really get at how these ideas cross over and come together. And here they are installed on the wall to give you a sense of them in this space right there next to our little text that kind of helps you get some thinking going on that particular theme. and. Um, just enjoy looking at them together, sort of these different visages that are, are floating there on the wall together. Uh, also in the Bressler Gallery, we have a, another recent acquisition by Gwendolyn Knight Lawrence, who was a prolific painter and printmaker. She attended Black Mountain College alongside, or was at Black Mountain College alongside um, her husband, Jacob Lawrence, who was also an artist in the collection. And he was teaching there that summer. This work is actually a work that is a print made based on one of her very earliest paintings and um, really thinks about how she's reflecting back on uh, an earlier time in her life. So this idea of time and place coming to the forefront for her. So that's a couple of the changes in that space. I was going to say, I really love the way she depicts textiles on the collar there. Yes. <laughs> and it's one of those paintings where I want to go up close and see the parts of it. And then I, you really have to step back and see it as a whole. And that's a, a, such a nice experience to have. Yeah. And there's a lot of symbolism you can sort of look into, like the seahorse shape that's behind her and the colors and the, the quality of the... Um, the ink is really sort of lush, I think, and rich in this, in this print here. 
So we've got quite a few changes in the um, Lent Sanger galleries as well. So here's another little panorama of sort of the back side of the space. Um, and the front side of the space. And this has changed even since you took the photo because that Turner is yes. now <laughs> out in the <laughs> core gallery. Yeah, so the Turner has moved, but again, it's fun to see. This is another reason why rotations are fun because sometimes something goes to another place in the museum and it's really nice to see works in a different context from where you maybe have seen them before. So it's fun for us to sometimes play with juxtaposing something that you think you're very familiar with and then showing it to you in a whole new light. Um, so um, one work that we are really excited to share, again, lots of new works that were acquired while we were close to the public, is this lovely basket that is by Eastern Band of Cherokee, our, um, Cherokee Indian artist, uh, Shan Goshorn. And it is using a traditional single weave technique. So this is a very traditional pattern that's been trashed, uh, passed down over the years through um, sort of Cherokee weaving and basketry traditions. But um, she really took that to a very contemporary place by working with new media ideas and interdisciplinary sort of approaches by using um, scanning and imagery from photographs and um, text to incorporate references to in this particular instance, um, actions taken by the government prior to forcibly removing the Cherokee from their homes and sending them to Oklahoma via the Trail of Tears. And so she's interweaving both historical and contemporary imagery um, of the Katua Mound near Bryson uh, City, North Carolina, which is uh, sort of part of the ancestral homeland and a very important site for the Cherokee, but bringing those two things together in a really beautiful blending of tradition and contemporary approaches to making. Then another really fun, bright, colorful um, work that is on view in the Lentzanger Gallery is this fabulous work by Nicolene Thomas, who you may know for her stunning paintings of um, interior scenes such as this and of African-American women. Um, really powerful work. And this is a really, really fascinating print that she made with Tandem Press in Madison, Wisconsin, that has really lots of layers. It's really truly like kind of a collage process um, that she is working with. And it incorporates this stunning set of patterns and colors um, that is really about sort of claiming a sense of self-representation, um, of, of creating a space to enter into that, you know, the artist has ownership over. Um, so big, fun, it's hanging out on the on, on a pretty large wall by itself, which really allows you a lot of space to take it in um, and appreciate it and enjoy it. Um, also in that space, we are showing yet another new work that has not been on view, uh, a print by Willie Cole titled Sunbeam Male Ceremonial. And you all may remember that the in that space uh, or that in that space in the Lent Sanger Gallery, we had another large work by Willie Cole called Stowage. And um, this work is actually in the same spot that Stowage was in because Stowage Again, had to go off view as a work on paper, but it gave, gave us this great opportunity to sort of bring in another element of Willie Cole's work, uh, which is still using this motif of the iron. But here he has taken it and turned it into a set of armor um, and actually juxtaposed it upon his own body um, and is sort of playing with a reclamation and with a, a, a almost a criticism, uh, I would say, of the way that things have been historically presented in textbooks in that format. Um, but it's great to be able to see different works by sometimes the same artist come up in a gallery to again give you that greater sense of their trajectory as artists. And so you can see it there and again the the Turner work is not on view, but just to see it in context there with the Whitfield Lavelle, which was on view previously. And then we've also added the Shazia Sikander work there in the back, which I don't think I'm going to have time to get to today. So you'll just have to come in. 
And the, with the Turner down, I'm adding a new um, a work of art that hasn't been on view before, another ceramic piece by David Stumpful. So yeah, you have to come in and see it. Um, and then the last one that I want to touch on today is a work by Joseph Fiore. That's another recent acquisition. And I actually really love that you start your experience in the galleries in the Linochi uh, gallery with the green landscape by Joseph Fiore from the 1950s. And then we end here with the 1992 work in the Lent Sanger Gallery. And he was really interested as an artist in geography and did a whole series of works about petroglyphs, you know, rock carvings. Um, and Kristen, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about why you liked this work so much because you just wrote about it for work of the week. But if you want to hop in, I would love to have you say a word or two about it. Oh, well, I just really appreciate his kind of the way he represented nature here. Um, you can read more about my opinion on it in our blog. I wrote a recent post and I had visited Hawaii as a child and saw, went to a petroglyph reserve. And um, this just brought up a lot of feelings of that trip. And I just, you know, with the way the world is right now, I think the environment is so very important. And I love how this work seems to be an ode to the beauty of nature. And I really enjoy the juxtaposition in the gallery of this work that's thinking about rocks and mark making and sort of artistic approaches around earth and you know geological formations right there next to this lovely work by Christina Cordova that Whitney showed earlier where the figure is standing on a rock um, and to think about place and where you're from and history and all of that and both works seem to touch on it in different ways and yet also the same same ways um, at times as well so they're sort of a nice pairing as well so I think that is sort of a quick overview uh, and hopefully that has enticed you to come in and see more and again there's going to be some other stuff coming up in the collection hall for rotation here very soon um i think we're about at time but if there are any questions we're happy to take them well feel free to put in your questions as hillary said and i just want to thank whitney and hillary uh, for leading this presentation i did get a sneak peek at fantastical forms this morning before we opened and it looks amazing and i hope everyone comes in to check it out and of course our collection galleries are always worth spending some time in so i hope to see you all here soon um and it doesn't look like any questions are coming in um so i just want to thank our members again for joining us today and I hope you keep engaging with us through our museum from home initiative or come to visit the museum uh, please do remember to reserve some time tickets and you can find more information about that and the safety protocols we have in place on our website um, and I'll send out an evaluation in a little bit but I hope you all stay well stay safe stay healthy um, and enjoy the rest of your day thanks everyone